My name is Spencer Seaver. I'm more commonly known as Ray. And um, I'm 90 this year. In fact, in September, I turned 90. And um, I'm ex-RAAF and uh, ex-airline pilot. So. I was born in the country in Forbes. And uh, we came down to the city, I think it was in about 1935. I was born in 1931. And it was during the Depression, and things weren't terribly good. It was my mother and my father and my sister and myself. My father was an American, actually, whose family had come out from the USA. And um, we came down to Sydney, and uh, we lived around the harbour in Kirribilli, mostly, until the war broke out. And then my father joined the Australian Army. Uh, strangely, he had still had an American passport, and America was not at war, and so the Australian Army got a little bit disturbed with this, and they told him to go away, get an Australian passport, and then come back and join the Army again, which he did. And uh, then after the war, we, uh, uh, we moved around a little bit, and... Uh, I finished up living in the Blue Mountains um, after the war finished. It was 1946, we moved to the Blue Mountains. I finished my education there at Katoomba High School. And then I worked for the Blue Mountain City Council as a cadet engineer for three years. At that time, uh, we graduated fairly early. I was only 16 when I did my leaving certificate. so. And I was studying at night and the job wasn't very satisfying and I was interested in aeroplanes, model aeroplanes. And one night I read the newspaper and it said that the Australian Air Force, Royal Australian Air Force, were looking for young men to join and become pilots. And I thought, well, that's going to be a lot more interesting than what I'm doing. And fortunately, I was selected and started my training at Point Cook in Melbourne in February 1951. Our course at the time was 18 months, uh, six months initial, uh, six months basic and six months advanced. Uh, my wings, I achieved my wings when I was, uh, uh, it, it was in July 1952. Uh, from there, I was selected to be uh, for fighter pilot training. Uh, at that time, uh, Australia needed pilots because of the Korean War. Uh, there'd been a rundown during the, at the end of the Second World War, the pilots were run down in numbers, and then with the Korean War, we needed young pilots again. So I was lucky enough to be caught up in that. So I went to Williamtown and trained there on, on uh, Mustangs initially and vampires. And then I think it was New Year's Eve 1952, a bunch of us got on a Qantas DC-4 and headed for Japan. Um, it was a long flight. We overnighted in Labuan, overnighted in Hong Kong, and um, then we went on to... Iwakuni, where the training section was. So uh, it was interesting at the time. Hong Kong was uh, an interesting place in those days, back in, you know, the end of 1952, a lot different then to what it is now. There was not a lot of news about Korea. Uh, having joined the Air Force, of course, we were mixing with uh, pilots who were instructors and and the general talk, you know, what do you want to do? Well, we all wanted to be fighter pilots, didn't we? And, um, and the only thing that fighter pilots did in those days was go to Korea. And so that's how we, we anticipated that that's what we were going to do. Um, I did have an interest in what was going on, uh, but I didn't really expect that I would be getting up there, uh, uh, you know, while the war was still on. But So that's the way it was. And so we arrived there from a very hot summer in Australia to a blisteringly cold winter in Japan, uh, sort of over a matter of three or four days. I'd never, even though it was cold enough in Katoomba where I lived, 
it was nothing like Japan when we arrived there, and of course Korea was even colder, and it was still winter when we got to Korea. So, hmm. uh, on looking back, um, the amount of overall flight time that we had when we arrived in Korea, ready for operations, was probably less than most a uh, aero club pilots have these days. I had less than 300 hours total flying and not a lot of that on jets. Our time in Japan was to convert us from Vampires, a single engine jet aeroplane, to a Meteor, twin engine aeroplane. And that was a very big step up because it was a much bigger aeroplane with two engines. None of us had had twin engine experience and that was a very important part of the Meteor operation. Uh, we got to the point where we could fly it, we did some formation training. Uh, a bit of air to ground work over the inland sea of Japan, but not very much. And then we arrived in Iwakuni and we we're all still very raw in terms of our experience. When we arrived we did two area reconnaissance flights, one west and one east and an experienced pilot took us out on that and brought us back and that just showed us it took us over the Han River into North Korea and uh, we had a look at the western part of North Korea and then, then we had a look at the eastern part of North Korea and then after that we were deemed to be fully operational. Uh, we went as wingmen and normally you would have four aeroplanes in a, in a group uh, a number one, a two, a three and a four. And number two is the most experienced pilot and he would be attached to number one, the most experienced pilot. And you would just fly as his wingman, do whatever he did, you did. The idea was to protect his back and when he went into a target, you got on his tail and went down and did what he did. You virtually fired your rockets when he did and uh, because you were watching him pretty closely and you didn't see a lot of what else was going on. Um, and so when he pulled out, you pulled out and, and that's the way it was until you learned the craft. And then after a while you would be made a number four and then you would be made a, a number three and then maybe if you were there long enough you might even become a number one and lead the, uh, lead the group of four. We also went out in multiples of four, uh, the largest would be 16, that's four groups of four, and that was a, that was a bit of a handful because with four, four groups of four all trying to maintain some sort of loose formation, it was pretty, uh, pretty taxing actually, particularly on inexperienced pilots. Hmm. Well, it was interesting in that our accommodation in Japan, we all, uh, the group that I was with and for all of my time in Korea, the squadron was virtually half non-commissioned officers, sergeant pilots and half officers. So we lived in the sergeant's mess in Japan in Iwakuni and that was very comfortable. We had uh, girls to look after our room for us and uh, a nice dining room and a nice bar. Our arrival in Korea in the middle of winter was to live in tents um, and the heating arrangement was an oil heater in the middle of the room uh, and a 44 gallon drum outside with a tube going into the heater. So you'd light the heater up and get that going pretty hot and uh, that's what kept you warm. Uh, we slept in little cots. They'd give you a cot and say, that's your corner of the room. There were six to a tent. And you, you sort of made your own little nesting arrangement there. Um, uh, the bar was down a little bit further and it was a very busy place, the bar, I must say. The shower uh, recess was also fairly basic, as were the other, shall we say, arrangements. And we actually had access to the American mess, they call it a mess. And as we were non-commissioned non uh, non officers, we were advised to take off our sergeant's stripes and just leave our wings on. Uh, 
and the Americans then thought that we were officers, so we were allowed to eat in their mess. And that's the way it was. When we went back to Japan, of course, we had to make sure we had stripes back on again because we then lived in the sergeant's mess. But uh, that's, that's the way it worked over there. Um, our hours of work, we would have a dawn patrol, which uh, in the wintertime was pretty brutal. Uh, you'd get up well before the sun and either go and sit in your aeroplane on standby or you might have what they call dawn patrols. We were doing interdiction work, that is keeping the supply trucks off the road. So they travelled at night because they knew that we couldn't fly at night. So early in the morning you'd take off in the dark and get up into North Korea as the sun rose, hoping to catch a few who were a little bit late getting into their hidey holes. And the same thing happened in the evening. You would leave just before dark so that you had time to patrol the roads up there to catch people who were a little bit late getting into their hidey holes. So uh, that was the sort of work we were doing. Um, the other sort of work you would be doing would be rocket attacks where you would go and uh, attack a defined target in various numbers or uh, just general daylight patrolling to just make your presence felt up there, yeah. We were all very young. Um, in my group, I think we we're all 21. And I don't think we had deep and meaningful thoughts about, about what we were doing. I think we saw it more as uh, doing our duty and having an adventure, uh, an opportunity to fly uh, an aeroplane. And I don't think we thought very deeply about how the war started, why it started, uh, what our role was in the larger picture. Uh, we were uh, dealing with life on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, doing, you'd go and do what you were asked or told to do, and then you'd come back and just socialise. Uh, we had a little group. We, we actually built some, ra not radio control models, they were flying models controlled by control lines, and that was one of the hobbies we had. There were other people had various hobbies that we had, and then of a night, because we didn't fly at night, after dinner we'd go into the mess and socialise there. And that, that was our life, in fact. The operations people would receive from me, we we're under the control of the Americans, and they would send uh, tasks over to 77 Squadron and our commanding officer and the other senior officers and the operations intelligence people would work out a program and we would be told to report to the flight hut at a certain time that there was a uh, four ship mission attacking a target at a certain place. And so you would go down and you would have a look, uh, they'd allocate you an aeroplane, uh, you would be given a position either one, two, three or four depending on your experience. Uh, there'd be a weather briefing there would be an operational briefing and then just before the time for takeoff, you would go out to your aircraft, <clears throat> establish radio communication, all start your engines together and the air traffic controllers would give you taxi clearance to go out to what was a single runway and it was a very busy runway. We had our group on one side of the runway and the American fourth fighter interceptor group on the other side, they were flying Sabres and they were, the, uh, they were the group that went up to the Yalu River. That was their job. Uh, our job was uh, a much shorter range thing. The Meteor was really a court, quite a short ranged aeroplane actually and our, our, our missions very rarely exceeded an hour but then we were so close to the border that that didn't matter greatly. So we would then get uh, be ordered to start our engines we would get a taxi clearance it was important to taxi out in the right sequence with one two three and four because if four went out first and the leader was behind him there was nowhere to uh, the taxiway was narrow and it was a single runway so you had to be very careful about uh, 
taxing out correctly. We would line up on the runway with number one on the left, number two on the right, as the first two to take off. And then very shortly after that, three on the left, four on the right, they would take off. And then the next task you had was to join up so that you became a formation. So the first group would pull up to slow down a bit, the second group would hold down to accelerate so that you, before you reached too far away from the airfield, you were in a formation. Uh, we were normally taking off to the northwest, and there was on our right North Korea and the Han River, and we had to go to a certain point before we could turn north because there was a... Uh, uh, a, a non-combat zone, Panmunjom, and an area there. So we had to go past that before we could turn right and proceed into North Korea. By that stage, we would get into what they called battle formation, um, which was where we separated out by 100 metres or so, uh, which made it easier for you and also easier to look for other aircraft in the in the sky and so you the leader would then take you up to the target as you approach the target you would move into uh, an attacking formation and then you would know whether you'd be attacking rolling into the left or to the right um, if you had rockets you knew that you would you would go down at a certain attack angle if you were dive bombing you would go at a much steeper angle if you were strafing, well, that would be a matter of opportunity. Uh, so that would be all part of your briefing before you left, so you knew exactly what to do. Having made your attack, you would then pull up, hopefully find each other again and make a formation and, and come back and land again. The landing pattern was an interesting one in that you would descend from your cruising altitude of maybe 15 or 20,000 feet, turn left and do a fast run at the runway and then you'd, you'd peel off one at a time, you'd number one, two, three and four, and you'd just come around in a line and then land one after the other and then taxi off the runway and, and proceed back to the revetment again. So all that happened within a matter of 45 or 50 minutes. So. It was a pretty busy time. Um, if you had a longer mission, sometimes they would put drop tanks on the wings and that would allow you to extend your range of operation a bit further on. But normally before you started in combat, that is, if you're air-to-air -air combat or doing an attack, it would be a good idea to drop the drop tanks because they affected the... Um, uh, aerodynamics of the aeroplane and also if you've got a bullet into a, a, a drop tank you'd probably get an explosion. The aeroplane was equipped with a ventral tank which was 175 gallons of gas on the bottom of the aeroplane, stuck to the bottom of the aeroplane and that was the source of some problems in that if you emptied that and was filled with uh, fumes and a bullet hit that quite often that would explode and that was known to be a danger that you faced with ground, or particularly small arms fire if you were doing a fairly low attack and some of the attacks were quite low. It's a bit hard to remember, I think you were so consumed with what you were doing that you didn't necessarily pay a lot of attention, you were very focused and particularly when you were looking in your gun sight you were very focused your world became just something like that with a grid that you were keeping on the target. And quite often you lost sight of everything. In fact, there was a danger that you would lose sight of the aeroplane ahead of you and fire your rockets before he'd fired his and pulled out. It happened to me once and it's very uncomfortable to, <laughs> to find the fellow behind you's rockets overtaking you and uh, so that that was one of the things you had to be very careful about so and so you, you had a general awareness but at, at target time you were very focused. The other anti-aircraft fire, the more established anti-aircraft fire, you could actually see the explosions and uh, 
sometimes you'd see quite a bit of that. We did have intelligence of where to expect it and a target would uh, have identified around it the possibility that there is heavy or medium anti-aircraft units around that target. And so you'd be, a, uh, you'd be forewarned that of the possibility. If you were attacking, uh, attacking troop concentrations, they would be firing small arms fire at you and that could bring you down and, and did on, on quite a few occasions. Uh, as I said, we used to come down fairly low, uh, particularly in strafing, not so much with rocketry. With rocketry, you had to be careful that your rockets, when they hit the ground and exploded, didn't throw up debris. If you were too low, you'd pick up your own debris. Um, we had four 20 millimeter cannons, which was really a very, uh, it was a lot of firepower. And um, uh, they, uh, we used to go down fairly low with that because you would be wanting to get a good look at your target. And on several occasions, it was known that pilots had left it a little bit too late to pull out. One of the problems was that we were attacking into terrain that we knew very little about. And so we knew that when we took off from Kimpo, if our altitudes read zero, which meant we were virtually at sea level, we knew that we were at sea level. When we got into North Korea, the terrain could be at 5,000 feet. And so your altimeter really was not a lot of use to you because we wouldn't know whether it was 5,000 feet or 5,200 or, or what. And so you were relying on your judgment. And if you became target fixated, that is you became so fixated on your gun sight that you lost a feeling for how high you were when you started to pull out, the aeroplane didn't respond immediately. It, it kept going down, even though your no nose was pointed up. The aeroplane would continue down for a period of time until it sort of got a grip on the air and then it would start to go up. And in that time, we had quite a few pilots who just actually pancaked into the ground uh, because they didn't realise how close the ground was. The other thing, of course, is we were going into valleys as well and there was a danger that you would come to the end of the valley and the valley went up more quickly than your aeroplane did. And that was a bit of a worry. So that was the sort of thing we were doing, yeah. The, the weather in North Korea, uh, we didn't get a lot of advance uh, information on that, of course, but the Americans did have a reasonable idea. There were times when the weather was so severe that we would not fly anyhow because we couldn't, there'd be no point in, we'd be just going up there in cloud and coming back in cloud and we wouldn't be able to find our targets. All of our targets had to be found visually. Um, and sometimes in a thunderstorm, it became a bit of a problem. And the other problem too, of course, was that on your return from your mission, you had a minimum amount of fuel. And so the weather at your base had to be, had to be visual conditions. You had very little time to carry out a complicated instrument approach. Otherwise you'd run out of fuel. And uh, I remember one time making a final approach and the fellow in front of me disappeared. And I thought, well, I wonder where he went. He'd run out of fuel on final approach and landed about 200 metres short of the runway. Fortunately, the only thing damaged was the aeroplane. He got out of it, he walked away from it, but uh, he, that's how close the fuel was. Uh, the media was notoriously um, uh, short of fuel for our sort of purposes. It was only designed as an interceptor fighter anyhow, not uh, a ground attack, you know, aeroplane. So. As far as enemy aircraft activity was concerned, the Americans kept them fairly uh, confined up around the Yalu River. Uh, but in bad weather, some of them would venture down and uh, looking for targets of opportunity. 
and this friend of mine and his wingman were flying in and out of cloud and they looked down and saw an American reconnaissance aeroplane um, flying along and then they saw a MiG coming in to attack it because uh, nobody knew the MiG was there because of the weather. Well, my friend and his wingman, they then went down to attack the MiG. What they didn't know, that there were MiGs above them watching them. So there was a, a situation developed there. Uh, my friend was able to... I, I think he was credited with destroying one MiG and damaging another. His wingman was damaged by a MiG and his engine was shot out. Fortunately, he was able to bring the aeroplane back and, and land it. Uh, but uh, there were other earlier uh, episodes where uh, 77 Squadron pilots had encountered MiGs. I think Flight Lieutenant Gogoli was credited with flying one down, uh, shooting one down. And I think a pilot officer Simmons also. Uh, and of course, in the early days of the media operation, the media was deemed to be an air-to-air -air fighter. And of course, it was not suitable for flying against high-speed supersonic swept-wing aeroplanes. It wasn't a good aeroplane at high altitude. And as a result, Quite a few uh, 77 Squadron pilots were shot down by MiGs. Uh, one, a friend of mine, spent two years in prisoner of war camp. And he is credited with having made the highest ejection from a jet aeroplane at that time. I think it was 30,000 or 38,000 feet. His parachute he came down in, and I think he was hoping to drift down to South Korea. But of course, that didn't happen. He finished up landing in North Korea and was taken prisoner. It was George Hale, yes. It wasn't a T-6. A T-6 is a, is a, um, a piston engine aeroplane. It was, a, it was the, what they call the Starfighter. Uh, not a Starfighter, it was a uh, F-80, uh, F-80, I think it was, yeah. Mm. And um, that night in the bar, the pilots, of, one of the pilots came around with a bottle of scotch uh, for George and thanked him. T-6 uh, was a bit like the Australian Wirraway. It was a single engine radial, and they used those as spotter aeroplanes. And um, I'm pretty sure that it was uh, uh, a, a, yeah. a, a jet, a, you know, a jet aeroplane. Yeah, well, George and I were very good friends. Unfortunately, he died some considerable time ago now from a cancer, but uh, uh, he and I were very close friends. It was very much... Uh, you were on Kimpo base and that's where you stayed. Uh, every month you got two days of R&R &R back in Japan and then in the mid-tour you got a long break of a couple of weeks in Japan uh, for R&R. &R. But we had very little contact with the Korean people themselves. We had uh, our Korean uh, health houseboy, his name was Kim, as was probably 85% of the Korean people at that time had a surname, Kim. So we just called him Kim, and I think we thought that was his Christian name, but it was not, of course, it was his surname. And he was a nice, quiet lad, but that was virtually the only real contact that we had. I think I went into Seoul one day just to have a look and see what it was like, but uh, that was only on one occasion. So, uh, In terms of our purpose in Korea was to do what we were told and, and fight the war uh, as we saw it. Um, we didn't see a great lot or take a lot of interest at that time in the political situation, for instance, or necessarily in what caused the war in the first place or the way in which the war was being fought uh, strategically. We were there, we were just pawns and we were doing our job and we were part of a bigger picture and we gave it very little thought. Uh, we were immature uh, in that respect, in that we were only 21 and most of us had lived fairly sheltered lives, even in the Air Force in our training for 18 months, we very rarely left the base, apart from a weekend in Melbourne. But um, 
And so from that point of view, we had very little knowledge of what our purpose was, apart from what we were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And with all due respect, we were not really briefed very much on what our purpose was before we went or during our time there. It was given that when you had done 40 combat missions, you would be issued by the Americans with an American Air Medal. Your next 40 missions, you would get an oak leaf to go with it, and every 40 missions after that. The British, in their wisdom, stepped in and said, we will not have our troops accepting foreign awards, and it was stopped. Many, many years later, a good friend of mine who was on course with me, in career with me as well, and became a career Air Force officer to the point where he became the Chief of Air Staff, took it upon himself to rectify that. And 60 years after the war, <laughs> we were awarded our Air Medals. And they were presented to us by the American Embassy in Canberra. But it took 60 years. One of the first thoughts I have in retrospect is being thankful that I was as immature as I was. Many of the people there, the more senior officers, some of them were married with families at home and others had been in the Second World War and they understood what was going on. And we were young and brash and did not necessarily see life as they saw it. Uh, later on, on reflection, one looks back and thinks, well, maybe that wasn't a bad thing for us to be like that. No, I wrote home very, very rarely. Uh, I was not married, of course. Um, I had a girlfriend before I left, uh, but we didn't correspond once I got to Korea. It just became, you know, I was away and, and we started our lives over again. Um, that, that was pretty much it, yes. We were six to a tent and we'd been together for 18 months doing our pilot training, another three or four months doing our conversion onto fighter pilot tactics and such. And we had lived together in barracks and now in a tent. Six of people, young men who knew each other reasonably well as just buddies. Um, I'm not sure that we entered into that sort of a discussion at any great depth. There were times when we lost people and I don't know even that that was discussed at great length. They were gone and they were gone. Um, and that didn't seem to affect us greatly for some reason. It just, it was a part of the picture. We had, we had become inured to it every now and again on course somebody would crash and die and you'd go to the funeral and then you'd get on with it again. We lost every course I was on. Somebody had an aircraft accident and was killed. And so that was that. Um, and it happened in Korea. And, and so it's been going on, yeah. So you, you didn't really dwell on, on things like that very much. Not at that time. Later on, there were times. Um, one of the saddest things um, was a fellow who was a prisoner of war. Came back, became a flying instructor, got married, and was killed uh, uh, training a pupil on a course that I was on. And, and I thought, well, that was sad. He'd, he'd, done, he'd done his bit. And, and, and it was now 
to be rewarded. And of course, that didn't happen. I think the rumour was around. We still kept our operations going. I'm not sure whether or not the allegation, allocation of targets was uh, done with that in mind. It may well be, uh, except that right towards the end of the war, I was on a mission with my wingman and we were shot at and he was shot down. So it was still busy at that time, as I mentioned, he was um, taken prisoner and uh, fortunately for him, it was during the summertime and he, he was not subjected to the cold weather. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate if you're attacking uh, a troop, a group of troops and you get shot down, uh, landing with a parachute in the middle of them just after you've been trying to shoot them down, is you're not welcomed very much. I'm not too sure what sort of welcome he got, but it wouldn't have been a very friendly one, I'd have thought. The politics of it may well escape them. Uh, the Korean War was followed not too long after by the Vietnam War, and of course the politics of that became a huge issue. And not enough was known of the politics of the Korean War. I think that what people could look at is the example of South Korea and North Korea and what's happened since. South Korea has become an extremely uh, pop, uh, powerful and, and, and well-run well, well country, uh, North Korea has become not so much. One of the things that has happened is that I've been back to Korea three times and one of the problems with the Korean War is very few people in Australia knew where Korea was. They knew very little about it. And I've taken an interest in Korean history and and that's been an interesting journey, just learning about how Korea became Korea. And now, of course, what we're getting is the rumblings again of, of North Korea and South Korea and, uh, and where that's going to go. And, and that's a bigger picture, of course, altogether. As I say, I now know a lot more about Korea than I did then and perhaps it would have been handy had we been briefed on Korea before we'd gone, where it is, what it's all about, why are we here? Um, but then again, maybe it's not our job to know that, we just do what we're told. It did not necessarily, the Second World War didn't necessarily influence my thoughts of the Korean conflict. I was a schoolboy when the Second World War finished and that was war over and done with. I think I saw the Korean conflict as being something entirely different and for different reasons and fought by different people. And, you know, the Second World War was over and done with and, and oops, here's a new war. I didn't necessarily tie them together, although there are links there, of course, as we probably know. Um, the Korean conflict was sad in lots of ways, but probably no sadder than what had happened to Korea before, from hundreds of years before, with the occupation of the Japanese, and, uh, and so it went on. So.